Act One of Paul Jones by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Berger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Marquis Doré, read by Amy Graymore. The Marchioness, his wife, read by Sonia. Count Emmanuel, their son, read by Thomas Peter. Margaret, their daughter, read by Lianya. Baron de Lecteur, read by Nima. Paul Jones, read by Todd. Louis Achard, read by Thomas Copeland. Monsieur de la Jarrie, read by Roger Moline. Mr. de Nosey, read by Recording Person. The Notary, read by James Curran. Lafay, valet to the Marchioness, read by Son of the Exiles. Jasmine, valet to Emmanuel, read by Eva Davis. Stage directions, read by Sandra. Scene, Castle Doré in Brittany, France, year 1779. Act One. Scene one, a saloon, furniture of the time of Louis the Thirteenth, a door in the centre, two side doors, a chimney piece, a looking glass on the top, a window on the right side of the spectator. Enter Count Emmanuel, Jasmin, La Feuille, and three servants. Emmanuel, stretching himself in an armchair. Jasmin, a crowned the postillion a clever fellow who only upset me twice since i left vin what roads upon my soul i must search our family records for some old vassalage law to make those peasants repair the roads to a servant in the livery of the time of louis the fifteenth who is bowing to him well lafoy very well i am glad to see you again and i my lord yes i understand what you mean may all the blessings of heaven descend in your throat enough there is something to drink to the other servants and this for you jasmine inform the marchioness of my arrival and say i await her orders either to pay my respects to her in her own apartment or attend her presence here for you my venerable fellows your services are needed elsewhere away to business exeunt la feuille in the act of following them la feuille what news in my absence my father always the same neither better nor worse his reason still estranged tis hard to say sir he will see no one but my lady not even his children but my sister always mourning tis a sad thing to see her tears poor young lady she never quits the chateau except to visit old achard still in his cottage in the park which he never leaves but for the old oak tree under which he rests himself there he remains for hours i believe he even prays there strange old man does the marchioness always send you to supply his wants yes my lord i wait on him but never do I hear any word pass his lips save good day, good morning, thank you, Lafay, nothing more. It is well, Lafay. Place those pistols on the side table. They are loaded. You know my mother is afraid of firearms. Here is my lady. Leave us, good Lafay. Enter Marchioness, dressed in black, slowly through centre door. Exit Lafay. Emmanuel goes towards her kneels and takes her hand madam by your leave rise my son i rejoice to see you once again emmanuel conducts her to an armchair she perceives the pistols and trembles what has alarmed you mother nothing sits down i received your letter my son and congratulate you you appear born for diplomacy more than for the army and should have solicited the baron de lectour to procure you an embassy instead of a regiment and he will certainly succeed madam for he has great influence and is moreover so deeply in love 
in love with a woman he has never seen oh madam de lecteur is a man of sense and all he hears of our family but increases his desire of the alliance besides he is worthy of it his ancestry is noble descended from the royal family of scotland it is a most suitable match he has insisted that all the preliminary ceremonies should be gone through in his absence has the approaching marriage been publicly proclaimed yes all has been arranged then we can sign the contract tomorrow evening on lecteur's arrival and did he not question you respecting lusignan did he not inquire why our family solicited the order for his banishment no madam such services are so common they are forgotten the next day besides it is generally considered a family secret that none dare question i alone shall not forget that wretch and wherefore because i yet may be revenged by other means than those oh say not so my son if you would have me live emmanuel passing his hand across his brow you are right mother what is done cannot be undone we must forget the past then he knows nothing nothing but shall i explain madam should he know all well i doubt not his resolution would still remain unalterable then he is ruined the case with most of our young noblemen but his influence is great with the king's brother in whose household he occupies a post of trust tis well we can retrieve his broken fortunes without impairing our own this marriage ensures the happiness of at least one of my children i will not confine you forever to this lone chateau far from all amusement near a father deprived of reason who refuses to behold the children his heart no longer knows it is for me worn and wretched as i am to watch your father in these gloomy walls while you my children young and gay should seek for pleasure and enjoyment emmanuel kissing her hand best of parents it is my sister alone who by her obstinacy your sister will bear in mind that her obedience alone can make me forget her fault and rest assured she will obey pardon my mother my desire to see this match concluded although my duty soon will call me from you but you well know how insignificant my life has been till now my name rendered so famous by my ancestors so honourable by you is a reproach to me who have done nothing to add new lustre to its brightness at my age my grandfather was a general my father the king's first equerry these are names which should not be forgotten stars in the heavens which must not be extinguished my poor father who for the last twenty years has not appeared at court was completely forgotten by our late king at his death and by our present monarch on his accession to the throne of france new sprigs spring up in the place of aged trunks and when i presented myself at versailles hardly was our name the glorious ancient name of marquis de Arey, known at our young court marchioness vehemently rest assured that name will yet sound loud enough in royal ears but for their majesties may heaven's choicest blessings rest on them and france who could oppose an obstacle to their happiness louis the sixteenth young and good marie antoinette young and beautiful surrounded by a brave nobility adored by a loyal people thank heaven fate has placed them beyond the reach of all misfortunes alas my son who is free from error and human weakness no heart though it be hidden by the purple is passionless the coroneted brow of kings the snow of grief may whiten in a single night nobility say you going to an open window behold those trees spring saw them in the glory of their verdure and scarcely has the breath of winter chilled them see they are barren their leaves fallen they are beloved by a faithful people look at that sea how peaceful how calm to-morrow this night perhaps this very hour may bear to us the blast which tells of the unfortunate victims buried in its depth although not living in the vortex of the world strange reports have sometimes reached my ear has there not arisen a sect of philosophers who count among their number men of high renown 
do they not speak of an entire world which like a floating island has separated from the mother country rebel children who refuse submission to their parent of a people styling themselves a nation have i not heard descendants of an ancient race of nobles have crossed the sea to offer rebel swords which their ancestors were only wont to draw at the call of their legitimate sovereigns and have i not been told or is it but a dream of my imagination that louis the sixteenth and marie antoinette forgetting that all sovereigns are a family of children have sanctioned those armed crusades and given letters of mark to heaven knows what pirate all this is true madam marchioness solemnly then may heaven watch over france exit slowly without looking back emmanuel alone seeing his mother depart this dreary castle inspires her with all these sad and sinister ideas as if some dreadful crime had been committed which lays a heavy load upon the conscience of its inmates i doubt futurity the moment i enter its walls when shall i quit them enter yasma handing a card to emmanuel for you my lord a card mr paul who is that mr paul enter paul jones i am he sir emmanuel haughtily it appears sir that you are extremely anxious to see me paul bowing i confess count that i set great value on the interview which i hope you will do me the favour to honour me with you have a manner sir of requesting a favour which admits of no chance of refusal pray be seated if this conference is to be of any duration paul sitting down quietly willingly for i have much to say to you speak sir request your servant to leave the room emmanuel to jasmin leave us exit jasmin now sir let me know whom i have the honour of addressing i am the captain on board whose ship young lusignan was banished to cayenne emmanuel fixing his looks on him impossible paul remains seated carelessly yet i am he tis true the last time but one we met when in brest you did me the honour to visit me on board my ship i wore long black hair a large straw hat and a sailor's pea-jacket all these change the appearance of a man above all if to his costume he adds the strong country accent of low britain emmanuel looking at him attentively indeed sir i believe i recollect beneath the hat you speak of i saw a pair of eyes bright as yours i have not forgotten them then that captain called himself by the name under which you call on me mr paul paul bows but you said it was the last time but one i had the honour of seeing you assist my memory sir i beg though i do not recollect the last time the last time count was in paris a week ago at a fencing match at the residence of the naval minister's son then i was an american officer by the name of jones light hair blue uniform navy underdress i had the honour to fence with you and to hit you three times while you i believe did not hit me once uh, strange <laughs> yes this is the look yet it cannot be the same person because heaven willed that a man's eye should be the only feature he could not disguise he imparted a spark of his heavenly glow to it captain paul is the same as the american jones the american jones is the gentleman now before you and to-day sir whom are you pleased to represent myself for i have no motive for any disguise nevertheless if you have a preference for any particular nation i shall be what you desire proceed sir be it so count france is the land of my birth the son of france the first my eyes beheld and although i have visited countries more fertile seen suns more brilliant still for me there ever has existed but one country but one sun emmanuel ironically your enthusiasm sir makes you forget the business of procuring me the favour of this visit it is now two years since as you were promenading the harbour of brest you saw amongst the numerous ships in port a brig with a slender waist high towering masts 
and you judge the master of that vessel must have had powerful reasons to trade with a ship carrying so much sail and so little lumber. Thence you imagined I was a pirate, a freebooter, corsair. Was I mistaken? I believe, Count, I have already expressed my admiration of your superior judgment of men and matters at first sight. No compliments, sir. To the point, if you please. In this persuasion, then, you came on board my vessel, and there you met Captain Paul. You were the bearer of an order from the Minister of the Navy ordering any officer bound on foreign service, if required by you, to transport to Cayenne a certain Lusignan, guilty of a crime of state. Tis true. I obeyed, sir, for I was at that time sailing under the French flag, and I knew not— Here Emmanuel rises and comes nearer to Paul— then that this said Lusignan had committed no other crime than that of having been the favoured lover of Margaret Doré, your sister. Emmanuel, touching his shoulder. Sir. Paul, rising and taking carelessly one of the pistols. You have very handsome firearms, Count. And loaded, sir. Is their aim true? If you will take a walk with me, I should be happy to try them together with you. Thank you, Count. I know these pistols. They are the make of a celebrated German armorer. I won their fellows from St. George's. Of course you know him, the colonel of the American regiment. He laid a wager to cut twelve balls, one after the other, on the blade of a knife. He did not miss a single one. And how could you win after this? Because I cut them more in the center than he did. This, sir, uh, is far into the proposal I had the honor to make to you. You are a clever shot, that's all. Paul, inattentively. Why should I not be? During our long days of calm, when not a breath of wind ruffles that mirror of heaven, the sea, we sailors, isolated and solitary, are obliged to accept such recreations as come within our reach. Thus do we practice our skill on the unwary swallows that seek for shelter on our spars or the wild seagulls, whose plaintive cry on their approach announces the returning breeze, and become somewhat expert in an exercise apparently so strange in our profession. Emmanuel, after a moment's silence. Proceed, sir. He was a good and brave young man, that Lusignan. He told me his history, how that ardent, profound, irresistible love grew in their hearts, like Paolo and Francesca, and how your sister repeated to him the words of the young girl of Verona, thine till death. Emmanuel, biting his lip. And too well did she keep her word. He told me of their mutual love, for a long time chaste as that of angels, his projects to create himself a name great as Alexander's, that he might lay his laurels at the feet of his beloved, his long and respectful suit with your mother, her haughty refusal and bitter railings, which he submitted to, as if no human heart was beating in his bosom. He told me of his grief, his tears, his despair when commanded by your sister to quit this neighborhood. He spoke to me of that night of farewell agony and woe. Out of a disgrace. Yes, you call it disgrace, shame, when a poor girl, alone and friendless, yields to her age, her passion, and her love. Well, they were separated, but she had fallen. Your mother, who might perhaps have saved the honor of her child if sacred duties had not severed them, for I know the virtues of your mother, as well as the misfortunes of your sister, a haughty and stern lady, who has no other advantage over others than that of having never failed. Your mother, I say, one night heard vainly smothered cries. She entered the chamber of your sister, approached her bed pale and speechless, tore in cold blood a new-born infant from her arms, while from poor Margaret's lips not even a sigh, complaint, or cry escaped. She had fainted on beholding her mother. Am I right, Count? Am I well informed? Or have I forgotten some minor details in this tragic history? None. They are transcribed in those letters of your sister, which Lusignan delivered to my charge when about separating from me, to herd with miscreants and criminals that I might restore them to the unfortunate writer. Give them to me, sir, and I swear they shall be returned faithfully to her who was imprudent enough. To complain to the only being who loved her in this world? Is it not so? 
imprudent girl, from whom a mother tears her darling child, and who dares to pour her bitter sorrows into the bosom of the father of her babe. Imprudent sister, who finds no friendship in a brother's heart, abandoned by her father, oppressed by a stern mother, might compromise her noble family by signing with her illustrious name letters, which may, how call you that young gentleman? Blast her excursion, is it not? As you are so well aware of the importance of those papers, why not fulfill your mission and deliver them to my sister, to my mother, or to me? He stretches his hand for them. I landed at Brest with that intention. But about a fortnight since, on entering a church, Emmanuel, ironically, A church? Yes, sir. And wherefore, if you please? To pray. Captain Paul then believes in heaven? And if I believe not in a supreme being, whose aid should I invoke when furious tempests rage? Emmanuel, impatiently. Well, and in this church? I heard a priest proclaim the approaching marriage of Baron de Lactour with the noble Lady Margaret Doré. And what does Captain Paul find astonishing in that? Nothing, Count. But a fanciful compassion took possession of my heart. I thought, as every one, even his own mother, had forgotten that deserted orphan, for, I suppose, of her own free will, and not by force, your sister marries Baron de Lactour. I thought that I would cherish the poor boy, whose christening was tears, without a name, without a family. At least he should not starve, whilst his relations enjoyed the blessings of this world. In your position, and with your ambitious projects connected with the alliance of Monsieur de Lactour, those letters are well worth a hundred thousand livres, are they not, Count? And this sum will only make a trifling breach in the half million composing your fortune, will it not? But what security have I, sir, for those hundred thousand livres? Right, sir. Nor will I exchange those letters, but for an obligation in due form, in the name of young Hector de Lusignan. As it was only on money matters we had need to treat, you might have spared yourself the trouble of relating that long story, and rather have sent me a confidential agent to settle this affair. The family Doré have always set aside, annually, for charitable purposes, double the sum which you require. He goes near the table and writes, Enter Jasmin. My lord. I am at home to no one. Leave us. Your sister, my lord. Some other time. She desires to speak with you immediately. No ceremony, sir. I can call again. No, Captain Paul, if you please. I would rather set our business at once. I will see my sister. But as it is unnecessary that she should see you, be good enough to retire to that closet. You will there find books to beguile your time. Willingly, sir. Enters closet. Emmanuel to Jasmin. Admit my sister. Exit Jasmin. Enter Margaret. Come, Margaret. Tell me quickly what you want. I am busy. There was a time, Emmanuel, when, after two months' absence, you would have at least embraced your sister. There was. But since that time, so many things have happened. And what could happen between children of the same mother? What could separate blood from blood, the brother from the sister? Margaret, you forget your disgrace. Oh, cruel brother! You know I cannot implore my father. You know the sight of my mother inspires me with awe. I am speechless before her. And now my only earthly hope depends on you. I come to you, Emmanuel, not as a sister to her brother. Joy in her looks, smiles upon her lips. No, no, I come to you with tears and humble suppliant before her judge, and with a single word you prostrate me. And what do you want of me? I wish to know whether the report is true. What report? That tomorrow evening. What next? Baron de Lecture? We'll be here, tis true. Oh, heaven! I was in hopes, having taken the precaution as he did to announce his arrival two months ago, you had time enough to be prepared. Despite those threats, hope still remained. Criminals have been pardoned at the foot of the scaffold. In a supplicating voice. Emmanuel! Well? Oh, dost thou not understand me? If heaven had willed that I could spare thee a pang, as thou canst save me from misery, 
if thou hadst prayed to me as i now pray to thee and by a single word my voice could save thee from despair how would i pour forth blessings unto heaven in speaking that one word this rests not with me an alliance determined by my mother and necessary to the honour of her family my father too desires it my father desires it would to heaven he could desire something poor old man that i might die for him an alliance determined by my mother oh he who suggested that alliance could easily obtain a renunciation of it necessary for the honour of our family thank heaven that family is powerful enough in name and fortune to gain no lustre from a prince's suit no emmanuel no you have bargained for me is it not so you have sold me for the sake of your ambition speak you have bartered me for a decoration a commission and you believed that as a child i would obey if i resisted my loneliness and misfortunes could give you power to bend me to your will you are mistaken emmanuel in my misfortunes will i find that force to resist even in my loneliness a power to oppose your purpose then you are resolved to disobey your mother that night when for the last time i saw him him whom my eyes may ne'er behold again a priest was waiting to unite us the sigurn was at my feet i refused to follow him for i would not disobey my mother but on that night i made an oath that if i could not be his wife never would i be the wife of another i have repeated it since on the head of my child and now it is not only the vow of a loving woman it is a mother's solemn oath and heaven i trust will give me strength to keep it farewell emmanuel mayst thou be happy exit margaret emmanuel gazes at her as she exits farewell poor reed who believest thyself an oak oh when my mother commands how wilt thou bend thy head how wilt thou prostrate thyself at her feet perceiving paul at the door of the closet ah there you are sir prepare your letters and i will sign the obligation you demand goes towards the table it is not necessary count emmanuel quickly how so i will give the hundred thousand livres to your nephew and i will provide a husband for your sister emmanuel violently but who are you then sir who dare thus play the master in my family paul going who am i i will tell you to-morrow for this evening i shall know it emmanuel detaining him and will you give me your word of honour that i shall see you again to-morrow paul releasing himself you have my word exit paul emmanuel alone what i see most clear in all this mystery is that this man must either blow my brains out or i will his end of act one Act Two of Paul Jones by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Berger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One: A chamber on the ground floor at Louis Achard's near the Chateau Doré. A door in the background, which, when open, shows at a distance the trees of a park at the right hand a window on the left a door communicating to another chamber on the raising of the curtain the marchioness alone is sitting before a table on the left side of the actor an open bible lies on the table the marchioness in deep reflection her large black veil surrounds her nearly entirely and falls to the ground enter Ashar, and perceiving the marchioness goes to her my lady marchioness raising her head is it you Achard? i have been waiting for you this half hour where have you been if my lady had gone fifty paces farther she would have met me under the great oak near the park gate you know i never go near it perhaps you are in the wrong madam there is one in heaven who has a right to our joint prayers and who it may be weeps at hearing only those of old Ashar. who tells you that i do not pray alone and why should you believe the dead demand that we be forever kneeling on their grave i only believe that 
if a particle of us survives underground that something trembles with pleasure to hear the footsteps of those we loved whilst living but if that love was a guilty one do you believe that death and blood have not atoned for it heaven were then too severe a judge yes heaven may pardon for omnipotence is all kindness but do you believe that if the world knew all it would forgive as heaven will the world that important word is even pronounced by you the world it is to that idol madam your pride has sacrificed all the feelings of a loving woman a wife a mother for the world's sake you wear that mourning robe beneath whose folds you hope to hide remorse and you are right for the world deems your remorse virtue you speak in the name of others with a bitterness of heart that might lead to suppose that you personally have something to reproach me for Ashar, have i omitted any of the duties which i believe i am bound to fulfil towards you the people who wait on you by my orders have they not borne towards you that respect and obedience which i have enjoined on them you have only a word to say pardon me madam it is only sadness not a bitter complaint it proceeds only from my lonely situation from old age you ought to know what bitter thoughts are weighing on your conscience what are those tears with which your heart overflows no through a sentiment for which i am grateful though i will not pry into its motives you yourself have taken care that i want for nothing you have not forgotten your promise for a single day and sometimes as unto the prophet of old even an angel came as messenger yes i know that margaret sometimes accompanies the servant who waits on you and i have seen with pleasure that she supplies your wants and i on my part have fulfilled my duty have i not for twenty years have i lived far from men and every living thing been banished from my cottage so fearful have i been that in sleepless indiscreet nights the wanderings of my poor mind might betray a secret that should never be disclosed yes the secret has been kept but tis the greater reason now for me to fear to lose in one brief day the fruit of twenty years of still more gloom more loneliness and terror than yours have been think what it is for twenty years to be the guardian of a madman who whenever a spark of reason lights upon his brain reproaches me with crime and hourly repeats those words those dreadful words with which the angels at the judgment day will wake me from my grave and i also madam i have heard those words i was here when he pronounced them and expired such is the fate of the wife my children too kept far from me that they may not be near their father my children who only know me by the terror i inspire my children who when i open my arms to them fall at my feet and call me madame this is the mother's fate you speak only of those who knew you to be their mother marchioness trembling Ashar. is it not true have you not trembled when reflecting that there exists a man who one day will call on me to know that secret and that i have no right to conceal aught from him nay compose yourself madam at the age of fifteen years you know that boy wandered from the family in which he was brought up in scotland and from that period nothing more was heard of him he must have forgotten the letter of his father he must have lost the token by which he could identify himself or it may be that he no longer dwells among the living cruel achar little do you know what mysterious secrets what strange contradictions are enclosed within a woman's heart cannot i rest unless my child be dead does it at twenty-five 
become of such importance to his existence that he cannot live unless that secret be revealed Asha, my old friend could we not tell him that his mother joined his father in heaven but on her deathbed left him as a legacy to her friend the marchioness doré who would prove a second mother to him mm, yes you might tell him so you and i know you could speak it with a steady voice you could look on him with a tearless eye and easy heart i know it well you could speak to him and your first words would not be my child yet he is the son of a man who was beloved by you so much beloved that for his sake you forgot the most sacred of all duties oh you can conquer your own feelings but should i behold him i should throw myself into his arms and cry aloud henry my dear henry but you asha have nothing to conceal forty years of a spotless name are not tarnished by that single word my child your name is not doré yours is not a title transmitted to you by noble ancestors to be inherited by as noble descendants hear me asha i came to tell you this i came to say to you have pity on me faithful as i have been to the promises made to the marchioness doré as faithful as i will be to those made to the count de morlaix the day the hour his son comes to me with the token by which i shall know him and asks me for his secret he shall know all the papers which prove his birth you are aware madam he may claim only at your husband's death that secret's hidden here points to his heart no earthly power can force or hinder its disclosures those papers are in a recess of the wardrobe near my bed the key is always with me therefore not but theft or murder can procure them the marquis may outlive you what then becomes of them the priest who assists me in my last moments will receive them under the seal of confession and i must live in agony and wretchedness until my death here stands a man perhaps the only one in the world unmoved by tears by prayers a man who rejects my gold and this stubborn rock crosses my way until a tempest buries me under its ruins asha my secret is thine do what thou wilt with it thou art the master i thy slave farewell exit marchioness Ashar alone go cold-hearted woman who knows no remorse who fears not heaven how dearly dost thou pay for the reputation of the most virtuous woman truly the world believes thee a saint and who could dare say nay thy will be done thy eternal wisdom will direct all enter paul well spoken old man there is more virtue implying resignation than in misbelieving philosophy would i had that maxim less on my lips and oftener in my hearts i beg your pardon sir but who are you for the present a disciple of plato all mankind are my brothers the world my country and under the sun do i possess no other resting place than the one i have built up for myself what do you want of me i am on the lookout twenty leagues from brest and about two hundred paces from the chateau doré for a cottage like that and of an old man possibly you and that old man's name is louis achard you are not mistaken it is myself paul taking his hat off may the blessings of heaven light on thy gray hairs for here is a letter i suppose from my father and it calls you an honest man Ashar, much moved and that letter contains it nothing yes something like a broken gold piece you should have the other half Ashar holds out his hand takes the gold piece and the letter yes yes it is and more that a 
astonishing resemblance child oh oh heaven what moves you thus you are the portrait i the living portrait of your father and know you not i loved i cherished him more than my own heart's blood so would i shed that blood for thee if thou shouldst ever need it embrace me then old man the chain of love is still unbroken between the grave and cradle and whoever may have been my father if to be like him with a clear conscience dauntless courage and a spirit that will never bend is all you ask then am i his living picture and more so from my soul than from my face asha gazing on him yes you are like your father that same proud face that same fire in his looks but why did i not see thee sooner young man many dark hours hadst thou made cheerful to me why because that letter bade me find thee out when i became twenty-five it is but lately i have reached that age within this very hour only already twenty-five already it seems to me but yesterday that you were born here in this cottage in this very room you first beheld the light and here i lived till i was four years old is it not so yes let me recall my memory i do recollect a chamber as a dream like this same one is there not a bed with green curtains yes an ivory crucifix above its head yes the wardrobe opposite where there were some books amongst others a large bible with engravings here it is the same bible yes yes the same then a window from which you could distinguish the sea an island the island of one mutier paul running to the chamber ah achard in the act of following him no no leave me for a moment i would be alone exit into chamber achard alone brave noble youth i thank thee heaven i thank thee Paul returning. Yes, it was the same room. After all, why hide my emotions? Look at me, old man. I have seen the tempest rage on the wild ocean, tossed my ship about like a feather ball. I saw men perish at my side, cut away like ears of corn by a scythe. I heard the dying groans of those who the day before had feasted with me. I caught their dying breath on a deck slippery with blood amid shot and cannonballs all this have i seen old man unmoved untouched but this room whose memory lives in me so sacredly where a father caressed me whom i shall never see again a mother who perhaps does not wish to behold me see old man this chamber is precious is sacred to me as a cradle as a tomb oh i must weep or i shall choke yes you are right a cradle and a tomb for here wast thou born here didst thou receive the last farewell of thy father then he is dead and my forebodings did not deceive me he is dead when how you shall hear all a minute let me breathe first opens the window what beauty in a fine autumnal evening the setting sun reposing in the sea glorious spectacle silent as the deity grand as eternity a man who often admired such a spectacle could not fear death my father died like a man of courage did he not he did and now do i recollect him my poor father though i was only four years old when i saw him for the last time he was a handsome young man of your age and his name count de morlaix a noble name amongst the names in Brittany. And my mother? Your mother, the Marchioness Doré. Paul violently. What sayest thou? The truth. Oh, heaven! Then Emmanuel is my brother, Margaret my sister. Do you know them already? 
Thou wert in the right, old man. Eternal wisdom directs whate'er it wills. It can do so, and what it does is long before ordained in its wisdom. He falls down in a chair and places his head in his hands. Your father and the Marchioness were betrothed to each other in early youth. I do not know what family hatred divided the good understanding between their parents. They were separated. Count de Morlaix sailed for San Domingo, where his father owned large estates. I followed him. I was the son of his nurse. I was educated with him. He called me brother, and I alone recollected the distance which his rank had placed between us noble man after two years residence in the island he returned to france and found his beloved wedded to another but the marquis called away to paris to attend his post near the king louis the fifteenth had been obliged to leave his young wife then too ill to follow him in the chateau de Ré, whose turrets you perceived hence Paul slowly raises his head and makes a sign that he sees them. During that journey, my father died and left me this cottage with the adjoining grounds. I took possession of them. Go on. One night, twenty-five years ago, I heard a knocking at my door. I opened it. Your father entered, bearing in his arms a woman veiled. Louis, said he, thou canst do more than save my life and honour, save the life and honour of my beloved. Hasten to the nearest town, and within an hour return with the physician. I obeyed. In a short time your father departed, again carrying in his arms, and always veiled, the mysterious female, who that night became your mother. And how did you know that woman was a Marchioness Doré? I offered your father to keep you with me. He consented. From time to time he came to pass a few hours with you. Alone? Always. But if you were walking in the park and the Marchioness met you, she would call you to her and embrace you as we do at strangers' child whose beauty we take pleasure in beholding. Four years passed away in this manner. Again your father visited me, but far more sad and gloomy than before. Louis, said he, tomorrow at daybreak I shall fight a duel with the Marquis Doré for life or death. Tis so arranged, and you, my only second, give me shelter for the night, and provide me with writing materials. I did so. He then sat down near this table, upon that very chair on which you sit. Paul rises. And there remained till morning without sleeping. At break of day he entered my apartment. I had risen. You were still sleeping in your cradle. Go on. Your father looked on you mournfully. If I fall, said he, to save this child from unforeseen misfortune, Deliver him with this letter to Field, my valet de chambre. He will take him to his own country, to Scotland, and confide him to trusty hands. When twenty-five years old, that child, if he lives, will call on you with the other half of this gold coin. He will demand from you the secret of his birth. You will tell him all. As for those papers which prove his birth, you will not deliver them until the Marquis be dead. Now, said he, let us go. He went to your cradle, and a tear moistened his manly cheek. Go on. That tear dropped on your face. You threw your little arms round his neck, saying, Farewell, father. I have often thought that childhood had a foreboding of the future. Childhood and old age are near to heaven. The meeting was in a lane of the park, about a hundred paces hence. On arrival we found the Marquis there, near him and on a bench loaded pistols. 
the parties saluted without exchanging a word. The Marquis showed the pistols to your father. Each took one. They counted thirty paces between them, then walked towards each other. It was a terrible moment, believe me, when I saw the ground gradually lessen between those two men. At ten paces' distance, the Marquis stopped and fired. I looked at your father. Not a muscle of his face was changed. He continued approaching the Marquis, and putting his pistol to his heart. He did not kill him? Your life, said he, is in my power. I might take it, but live, that you may pardon me, as I forgive you. With these words he fell dead. The Marquis's ball had pierced his heart. My father, my father, and he lives, that man, does he not, Archcard? Let us go to him, tell him this is his son, his son, you hear, his son. You must fight him. Heaven has revenged you already. That man is insane. True, I forgot. And in his madness, this bloody scene is always present to his eyes. Twenty times a day does he repeat the dying words of your father. And this, then, is the reason why the Marchioness never quits him for an instant? And for this reason, under the pretext that he refuses to see his children, she never lets Emmanuel and Margaret come near him. Poor sister! And now her mother would make a new victim, enforcing her to marry Baron de Lactour against her will. Yes. But that miserable Lectour takes his wife to Paris, and her brother gets a regiment of horse. The Marchioness no longer fears the presence of her children. Her secret, then, is only confined to her and two old men, who may die tomorrow, this night, and the Dowager Marchioness Doré, a pattern of a mother's love of connubial virtue, survives surrounded by the respect, the admiration of the world. Oh, dost thou believe that my mother... I beg your pardon. True, I do not believe it. I am in the wrong. Forget all I said. Judge for yourself. Must I add that the last will of your father was faithfully executed? Field came. The very same day he left with you. Twenty-one years have elapsed, and since that hour not a day has passed that I have not prayed to heaven on the grave of his father to bless that child. Heaven has listened to my prayers. You are here. Your father revives in you. I see him again. I speak to him. I am comforted. Paul, looking through the window. Silence. Someone comes this way. Most likely a servant from the castle. Margaret accompanies him. Margaret, my sister. Leave me alone with that child, Achard. I would speak to her. Recollect that your secret is that of your mother. Be easy. I will only speak to her of her own. Exit Achard in the next room. Paul alone. Poor girl. That interest I felt for thee yesterday when I saw thee was then a brother's love. She comes. Enter Margaret and La Feuille. That will do, La Feuille. Put that basket there, and wait for me at the park gate. Exit La Feuille. I beg your pardon, sir. I thought Achard was at home. He is in the next room. Margaret, going towards it. I thank you, sir. Exit Margaret. Paul alone. Oh, poor lonely Paul. Why shall I not throw my arms around her neck? Why not say to her, Margaret, no woman ever loved me with a woman's love. Love me with a sister's love, for I am thy mother's son. Oh, mother, when you deprived me of yours, you also deprived me of the love of that angel. May heaven, in his goodness, render you in eternity that happiness, of which you have deprived yourself, of which you have deprived us all. Re-enter Margaret. Margaret, in the door which separates the two chambers. 
Goodbye, Asha. I wanted very much to see you, for who knows when I can do so again. In the act of going out of the centre door, Margaret. She turns round, astonished, but makes a second motion to go. Margaret, don't you hear me? I call you. True. You have pronounced my name, sir. But I could not suppose, not knowing you. But I know you, I do. I know your distress. I know there is no heart to whom you could confide your grief, no arm that would support you. You forget our father in heaven, sir. No. And if, far from forgetting him, I considered myself as his messenger, if I said to you, Margaret, I am your friend, your most devoted friend. I would ask of you, sir, where are your proofs of friendship, of devotion? And if I gave you one? Margaret, with hope. Oh, then. You wear a bracelet on your left arm. Who told you so? That bracelet shuts with a lock, whose key is hidden by a ring. Oh, heaven! There exists a man, to whom you made oath, in a night of parting and despair, that, long as that ring should not be restored to you... I would not accept of any suitor. And next! Do you know this ring? Oh, have pity on me! He is dead! Margaret, he lives. Loves you still. He lives, he loves me. And how does that ring happen to come in your possession? Banished, proscribed. He thought it was his duty to restore you to liberty, that you might bestow your heart and hand elsewhere. When a woman has sacrificed to a man, what I have sacrificed to him, he is the only man she can ever love, the only one to whom she can ever belong, to him alone or heaven. Margaret, you are an angel. Tell me, you saw him then? It was I who had orders to bear him to Cayenne. During our passage he told me all, and I perceived that I had been made an instrument of vengeance, not of justice. Then thought I that Providence had selected me to be the judge of judges. Lusignan is banished, but he is free. I left him at New York, waiting the success of the petition which his friends have already laid before the king. And do you believe he will be pardoned? I have obtained more than that. Let me kiss your hands. Come to my arms, Margaret. You are a saint. You do not then despise me. Margaret, had I a sister, I would pray to heaven that she might be like you. You would have an unfortunate sister. Perhaps. Oh, but you do not know. What? Monsieur de Lecture must have arrived by this time. I know it. This evening the contract is to be signed. And will you sign it? They will force me. Have you not the courage to refuse? I feel only courage to die. Poor child. Whom shall I implore? To whom apply? My brother. Heaven knows I pardon him. He does not understand me. My mother. Oh, sir, you do not know her. A woman of stern virtue, of an iron heart. When she says, it is my will, nothing remains but to weep and to obey. My father, he is insane. He lost his reason, and with it all remembrance of a parent's love. For ten years my eyes have not beheld my father. For ten years I have not kissed his trembling hands, his silver hair. He does not know whether he has a child, a daughter. He would not know me again, and should he take pity on me, my mother would place a pen in his hand and bid him sign, and he would sign, the poor, the weak, old man, and Margaret be a condemned victim. Margaret, I will be present at that signature. And who will introduce you into the castle? I have the means to do so. Oh, my brother is brave, stubborn. His ambition finds an opening by my marriage. Oh, sir, sir! Your brother is as sacred to me as you yourself. Fear not. You make me shudder. And how do you mean to act toward Lactor? Ask an interview of him. And then? Tell him all. Paul, kneeling down. Let me adore you. Sir. Oh, as a sister. Oh, sir, you are good. You have a noble heart, and heaven has sent you to my assistance. Believe it. Consequently, this evening. Fear nothing. Only try to let me know, although it be but by a sign, how you have succeeded with Lictor. Farewell. Farewell. Margaret, 
shaking his hand. Farewell, you whom I do not know by what name to address. Call me brother. Farewell, brother. Farewell, sister. This is the first time I am addressed by that sweet name. May heaven reward thee, young girl. Exit Margaret. Paul calling out. Achard. Enter Achard. Now, to my father's grave. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three of Paul Jones by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Berger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Same scenery as in the first act. The chandeliers are lighted on the chimney. Emmanuel and Baron de Lectour. Permit me, my dear Baron, to welcome you to the castle of my ancestors, built in the time of Philip Augustus. And venerable enough does it look, like one of those old feudal strongholds of the days of ancient chivalry. And so it was, and you see in me their last representative, your most obedient and humble servant to command, Emmanuel Doré. And the descendant of a most noble old respectable family yes but i do not as yet call myself old enough to wish to spend my life in this very old and respectable castle and i hope baron you have not forgotten me certainly not i was in hope of presenting you of your commission as colonel of the regiment of dragoons of her majesty i knew there was a vacancy i had hopes to succeed for you when I was informed that the regiment had been given to somebody at the request of another, some mysterious admiral, something of a freebooter or corsair, whom His Majesty has taken a fancy to, for having beaten the English at Whitehaven, where he conquered a fort and took one of their ships on the coast of Ireland. For these exploits, His Majesty has invested him with the insignia of the order of military merit and presented him with a gold-mounted sword as if that man had been a nobleman well nothing to be done that way we must try something else and the decoration promised for me is a cross of st louis oh nothing easier i have the minister's word well you are aware how anxious i am to be noticed to obtain some post or other suitable to my ancient name my birth perfectly and how did you get rid of all your numerous engagements by telling the truth i have publicly announced my marriage bold enough indeed above all if you confessed that you have taken a wife in the wilds of our province i did confess it then they did pity you instead of being angry with you i am sure ah uh, you understand our ladies at court know of no other son than that of paris and versailles the remainder of france is all greenland lapland nova zambia terra incognita to them and they expect to see me present them with some strange animal some unknown species hands of an ogre feet of gigantic shape but they are mistaken are they not emmanuel you told me that on the contrary your sister you will see her then that poor madame de chons will be sadly disappointed turning around what is the matter enter jasmin miss marguerite doré requests the baron de lecteur to favour her with the honour of a private interview me with the greatest pleasure no <laughs> you are mistaken jasmine you must be mistaken i have the honour to assure you my lord that i have faithfully repeated my orders impossible baron you must decline by no means mr bluebeard of a brother jasmine tell that fair lady my betrothed that i am at her command on my feet 
on my knees, just as she pleases. And you, Count, I hope you have confidence in me to permit that tete-tete. -tete. Ridiculous. By no means. Nothing more convenient. I am no crowned head, not I, to marry a lady at the sight of her portrait, or by procuration. I am anxious to see her, in propria persona, or openly. Entre nous, my dear Count, is there anything deformed, or... No, no, she is pretty as an angel. Well, then, what does all this signify? Come, must I call my guard? Exit Emmanuel. Jasmine, tell the lady I await her orders. Exit Jasmine. Enter Margaret. I beg your pardon, Miss Doré. It would have been my duty to solicit the favor you are pleased to bestow on me. The only fear of being thought indiscreet. I am much obliged to you, Baron, for that delicacy, and it only increases the confidence I have in you. Whatever it may be, I feel myself much honored by it, and I will endeavor to prove myself worthy of your good opinion. Aside. Upon my soul, Emmanuel's in the right. She is a charming creature. What I have to tell you, Baron, I beg your pardon, but... Faltering and weak, looks for a chair to support herself. Good heaven! It is then something very difficult, or, without my being aware of it, do I look so imposing? He takes her hand. Speak, but not only an angelic figure. Charming hands, true hands. A la royale. Margaret, taking her hand back. I hope, sir, this is the language of mere gallantry. No, upon my honour, the plain truth. And even should you really believe all you say, those motives alone cannot be of such a value in your eyes that you should set so great a price. Indeed, upon my honour. I hope you consider marriage as a most solemn engagement. That might be, if I married a dowager, per example. Well, sir, I beg your pardon, if I was mistaken, but I have thought sometimes that you had formed some idea that there existed a reciprocity of sentiments in the union proposed between us. Never, no, never. Since I have seen you particularly, I have no hopes to be worthy of you. How shall I express myself? Of your love? But my name, my rank, render me worthy. If not of your heart, at least of your hand. And how, sir, distinguish you the one from the other? Why, three-fourths of all marriages are managed in that way. The man because he wants a wife, the woman because she wants a husband. It is a change of position, a social arrangement, nothing more. And what has sentiment? What has love to do with all this? I beg your pardon. Perhaps I do not express myself properly. A young maiden's bashfulness in speaking on such a subject. By no means. Clarissa Harlow could not express herself better. It is clear as daylight. I understand perfectly well. And if, sir, consulting my heart, my feelings, I foresaw the impossibility that I should ever love. Then you should not tell me so. And why? Why? Because, upon my honour, you are too candid, too naive. And if it was not candour which guides me, if it was delicacy, uprightness, if I added, sir, and made the shame of that confession fall on those who forced me to make it, that I have loved, that I love still, some cousin some petit cousin is it not that pest we meet with everywhere those baubles playing with missus's cats or ladies lapdogs but what of that do we not know those famous attachments there is not a boarding school miss who after her vacations returns to school without one of those powerful children's passions in her heart unfortunately for me I am no longer a boarding school miss, sir, and although yet young, 
it is a long time since the days of children's plays and infant attachments have passed by. When I speak to the man, who does me the honour to ask for my hand, when I speak to that man, of my love for another, he ought to believe me, if I say, it is a serious, profound, eternal love, one of those loves, deeply, and forever rooted in the heart, a love for life, for eternity. The devil! But this is quite a pastoral romance. Then let me see. Is the young man, come il fou, such a one as may be received into society? Oh, the best of human beings, the most devoted. Leave me the perfections of the heart alone. He is a pattern of all earthly accomplishments, of course. I ask you, what family? Is he a nobleman? If a woman may, well, if a woman may be seen publicly with him, you understand me, without making her husband ridiculous? His father, who died when he was quite a child, was a magistrate at the Court of Appeals at Rennes. Law, nobility, persons of the long robe. I wish he had been anything else. But, after all, everybody is not so lucky as the Duc de Longueville. Who picks out the lovers for his wife? I beg your pardon, but we can manage that. For the sake of appearances, he must not show himself for the first six months. His friends must procure some post at court for him. He must be introduced to you by a friend of both parties. That's all. And then all will be perfectly regular. I do not understand you, sir. What I tell you is plain enough. However, you have your engagements, your liaisons. I, for my part, have my own too. Then there is no reason why we should not marry. Form a union so convenient in all respects, and if once wedded, well, we must make our life as tolerable and comfortable as possible between us. Margaret, retreating. I beg your pardon, sir. I have been very imprudent, perhaps very guilty, but I have not deserved such insult. Oh, oh, I blush more for your sake than for mine. Yes, sir, now I understand you. A love with all ceremonies in the eyes of the world, and another private secret one, the mask of virtue, but the ignominy of vice. And is it to me, to the daughter of the Marchioness Doré, you dare propose that disgraceful bargain, you make those vile, infamous proposals. Oh, you must take me for a very miserable, despicable creature. Falls down on the chair and hides her face in her hands. Lectour, calling. Emmanuel. Enter Emmanuel. My dear, your sister is pleased to have a fit. Pray pay attention to these things, lest they turn to a chronic disease. Madame de Moulin died of it. There, take my flacon, let her inhale it. Exit Lectour by centre door. Margaret, Margaret, well, what now? Weeping, come, compose yourself. Several guests have arrived already. Also the notary, my father is coming down. My father? Are you sure, my father? Of course, his presence is absolutely necessary. Well then, he is my soul. My last, my only hope. May heaven lend me fortitude and courage. Exit Margaret, by the door on the left hand. Poor sister, I believe thou wouldst do better to ask reason of him. There comes Lecture, in conversation with Monsieur de Nozay. Enter de Nozay and Lecture. But, do you know, that's charming, absolutely bon ton. I also have ditches marshes ponds and ducks i'll ask my steward where all these things lie only think emmanuel there's that gentleman telling me of something very curious and do you catch many ducks that way prodigiously only think that gentleman goes in the water up to his neck and about what period of the year why in the winter in december and january puts a hollow pumpkin on his head, and sticks himself amongst the reeds. 
this produces such a change in him that the ducks don't know him and come within fingers reach of him is it not as nigh as we are to each other and the gentleman kills them to his heart's content by dozens that must be delightful to your lady if she is fond of ducks they're her delight what an interesting lady your wife must be de Nose, bowing sir i assure you when i return to versailles i will report that at the first levee at court and i am sure his majesty will try your experiment in the pond in the park emmanuel half loud to him excuse me Baron, but they are country neighbours we had to invite to our present solemnity how so you would have committed murder to deprive me of that gentleman's story he makes part of my future wife's dowry i would have been distracted not to have made his valuable acquaintance enter la feuille la feuille announcing monsieur de la Jarry. lecture to monsieur de Nozay. also a sportsman oh no a great traveller enter de Jarry, wears a fur coat exit la feuille my dear de la Jarry, you are buried in furs upon my honour you look like the czar of muscovy why count you know when one arrives from naples ah the gentleman has arrived from naples direct and i find it so devilish cold here did you see mount vesuvius see it to be sure that is to say at a distance but that is not the greatest curiosity in naples a smoking mountain my chimney does the same and then madame de la Jarry is so afraid of eruptions you visited the dog's grotto i presume and why should i to see an animal catching the vapors throw a poisoned cake to the first dog and you will have the same sight then madame de la Jarry is so very fond of dogs that she could not look at such a spectacle without tears i trust at least that such a savant as you are has been to see the sulfatara i never went near it besides i can easily figure to myself such a place three or four acres of brimstone that's all producing nothing but matches and then madame de la Jarry cannot bear the smell of brimstone emmanuel aside to lecture well and what say you of that genius lecture the same i don't know but is it because i heard the other stories first decidedly the first story is the best enter la feuille la feuille announcing mr paul emmanuel turning round who also a country neighbour no quite different how does that man dare to come here just now i understand some low-born fellow some plebeian is it not so poet painter musician something like it well i assure you emmanuel that species is getting quite to be in vogue that damned philosophy upsets all an artist now associates with our great men hardly bows to them remains seated when others rise they talk they joke they criticize together a bad taste but just now very fashionable you are mistaken lecture he is neither one nor the other it is a man to whom i must speak alone taking de la Jarry by the arm walk into the next room with me sir i am anxious to show you some handsome paintings the islands of ischia capri nisida oh i have seen all from the windows of our hotel but i did not visit them madame de la Jarry is so afraid of seasickness lecture taking de Nozet's arm and you say sir one need only put his head in a pumpkin nothing more only bore some holes in it for your eyes and your mouth exeunt all four through the door on the right hand the centre door opens 
Paul appears in the background. Margaret, opening the door of the closet. Paul hastily meeting her. I was looking for you. Well? I told him all. And? In ten minutes the contract is to be signed. I thought so. The wretch. And what shall I do now? Have courage, Margaret. Courage? Oh, I am undone. Paul, giving a paper to her. This will cheer you. And what are the contents of this paper? The name of the village where you will meet with your son, and the address of his nurse. Oh, you are an angel of consolation. Silence. Whatever may happen, you will find me at a chard's. Enough. Re-enters the closet. Enter Emmanuel by the door on the right hand. I expected you some other time, sir, and before a less numerous company. It appears we are alone now. Yes, but in a few minutes a party will be here. Many things may be expressed in a few words. You are right, but it needs a man who has but a few minutes to spare to understand them. I am at your command. Enter Lectour from the door at the right hand, advances in the background, and listens, without being perceived by Emmanuel and Paul. You spoke to me of certain letters. True. You fixed a certain price on those letters. Also true. Well, are you ready to deliver them up for that price? Emmanuel, delay the signature on that contract till tomorrow, and grant me an interview this night. It cannot be postponed. The interview you ask is of no use, but here we are. Are you ready? Hear me. Yes or no? Two words. Yes or no? Paul, coldly. No. At what hour tomorrow, sir, would you be pleased to take a short walk with me? I am sorry, Count. I cannot accept your offer. Then, sir, you do not understand me. On the contrary, perfectly well. That walk means nothing else. Then a duel. And you refuse? I cannot fight you, Emmanuel. You cannot fight me? Upon my honor, I cannot. You say you cannot fight me? Lectur bursts out laughing. <laughs> Paul, turning around. No, but I can fight that gentleman, that infamous miserable wretch. What do you mean? Paul, to Lectur. You understand me, don't you? Lectur coldly. Yes. Only you forgot, sir that a gentleman requires no insult in order to provoke him to fight. Recollect, sir, that you may choose your time, the place, and weapons. Emmanuel will arrange all these things with your second that regard me in this way. And I hope, sir, he will conceive that for me our meeting is only postponed. Silence. Somebody comes. And you remain here? I remain here. Here. Here, or in that closet, if you prefer it. Exit Paul in the closet. Jasmin? Enter Jasmin. Request the gentleman to come in. Emmanuel and Lecture on the left. Enter La Jarie, de Nozay, a notary on the right. The latter places the contract on the table. Some other gentlemen as guests. La Feuille announcing. My lady, the Marchioness, Doré. Enter Marchioness by the centre door. I am much obliged to you, gentlemen, for the honour you do me in witnessing the betrothal of my daughter with Baron de Lectour. I have also requested the presence of the Marquis, my husband, although unwell and suffering, to assist on this family festival, that he may at least render you his thanks by his presence, if not by words. You are aware of his melancholy disease. You will not then be astonished if some incoherent words. Yes, madame. We know the misfortune under which he labors, and we can only express our admiration of that devoted lady who for twenty years has borne the burden of more than her share of that misfortune. Emmanuel, kissing his mother's hand. You see, madame, everyone adores you. Marchioness, half loud. Where is Margaret? Emmanuel, the same. She was here just now. Let her be called. 
Lafay announcing my lord marquis doré enter the marquis doré full court dress decorated with the cross of st louis the marquis is supported by two servants he stops at the door and looks with astonishment and the distracted air around him then advances sits in an armchair in the middle of the salon near the table sighs and bends his head down on his bosom exit emmanuel shall i read the contract it is unnecessary the parties are acquainted with its contents offer the pen sir if you please the nozay and la Jarry sign as witnesses the first then turns to the left the other retakes his seat enter emmanuel and margaret emmanuel conducting margaret here is my sister margaret salutes the guests then turns to her mother madam marchioness looks on her sternly it is your turn my son emmanuel signs yours now baron lecture signs presents the pen to her and sits down next to la Jarry. the marchioness signs now yours now my daughter margaret advancing madam marchioness reaches her the pen over the head of the marquis sign margaret advances wavering stretches her hand out to take hold of the pen no no never i cannot throwing herself at the feet of the marquis oh my father father have pity on me marchioness bending down half loud are you mad my father marquis raising his head who calls me whose voice do i hear what are you doing at my feet my child what do you want what do you ask of me margaret madam you will not hear me then let me implore my father's mercy unless you prefer pointing to the notary that i should invoke the law marchioness with a forced smile come gentlemen a family scene is to be acted and those things no doubt very pathetic to parents are generally very tiresome to strangers gentlemen please walk into the next rooms my son do the honours baron i beg your pardon certainly madame turns round to la Jarry. you say then that madame de la Jarry is horribly afraid of the sea so much so that she nearly died in crossing the lake the other day exeunt omnis marchioness when all are gone shuts the door violently and sits down hastily on the left-hand side of margaret now as there is no one present except those who have a right to command you sign or leave the house oh have pity on me madam marchioness takes her arm she clings to her father my father my father spare me spare me no no i have not seen my father for ten years you shall not tear me from him till he knows me again till he throws his arms round his child my father it is your daughter marquis trying to recollect what sweet voice is that who is that child who calls me father marchioness throws herself between the marquis and margaret it is a voice which disobeys her parents a rebel child father look at me save me defend me i am margaret margaret i had a child by that name it is i i your daughter only those who obey us are our children obey then only call yourself our daughter oh father i will obey you but you will not command my unhappiness you will not bid me go and remain wretched for ever you will not drive me to despair marquis embracing her come come to my arms oh how delighted i feel and now oh it, it seems as if i remember sir marquis raising his head beware madam beware did i not tell you i begin to recollect speak speak my child what ails thee oh i am very miserable 
everybody then is unfortunate in this house in distress gray hair and brown children and old men ah i also i also he falls down in his armchair am most wretched marchioness who has gone to the right hand of the marquis marquis return to your chamber it is absolutely necessary yea to remain alone with you again face to face that will do madam when i am mad yes father you are right my mother has devoted herself long enough to watch to nurse you it is my turn now your daughters father let me remain near you let me be your guard day and night poor girl wouldst thou have the courage the strength oh yes father as truly as i am your child i will and why did i not see my daughter for ten long years they told me that you would not see me that you did not love me marquis taking her head between his hands they told you i would not look at thy sweet face they told you so they told you a condemned wretch would not behold his deliverer and who said that a father would not see his daughter who dared to say to say to thee thy father loves thee not i you you are then the demon whose mission is to cheat me in all my affections you then must prove the source of all my misfortunes and now you wish to destroy to break the heart of the father as you broke that of the husband he rises you are talking idly sir no madam rather say i am placed between an angel who would restore me to reason and a demon who would drive me mad again no no i am no longer insane must i give you proof of it madam must i relate a story of letters crime adultery of that horrid duel marchioness takes him violently by the arms you must be more abandoned by heaven than ever to breathe those things to ears which should not hear such words blush sir look at her and now say if you dare you are not mad right oh you are right falls back in the chair thy mother is in the right i am mad do not believe my words believe hers only thy mother's oh she is all devotedness all virtue she passes no sleepless nights remorse does not disturb her pillow what does she want of thee my misery my eternal wretchedness and what can i do to save thee from misfortune i a poor old distracted man i who always see the blood streaming from a wound see the grave open the dead rise and speak to me oh you can save me you alone say one single word they want to marry me force me to marry oh hear me a man i do not love i can never love father hear me to a wretch an infamous man and they conducted you hither you my father to sign that contract that that on that table it lies marquis takes up the contract without consulting me without asking my consent do they take me already for a dead man do they fear me less than a ghost that marriage sayest thou my child will render thee unhappy for ever for ever then i forbid it but i sir have engaged my word given my consent mine and yours no that marriage shall not take place rises too horrible are the miseries of a union where the wife cannot love her husband it leads to madness now i speak not of myself my child no no not of myself your mother always loved me loved me faithfully what makes me mad is quite different that contract tries to take it marchioness prevents him what makes me mad me it is a grave it opens see the spectre rises from its coffin see it approaches his ghost it speaks to me hear his groans 
Marchioness repeats in his ear the dying words of Morlaix. Your life is in my power. I might take it. Marquis, his madness returns, increases. Dost thou hear? Dost thou hear? Marchioness continues as above but i would have you live so you may pardon me as i forgive you marquis sinks exhausted in his armchair oh pity morley have pity on me father marchioness with a triumphant look you see your father's mad oh no my voice my love my tears will bring him back to reason try then father sir marquis trembling oh oh father marchioness to the marquis take that pen sign sign i say you must i command you she places the marquis's hand upon the contract after having placed the pen in his hand marquis obeying like a machine signs part of his name trembling margaret falls down fainting then i'm lost enter paul from the closet marchioness doré who calls me margaret rises enter emmanuel and lecture from the centre door going towards paul sir sir paul orders them back with his looks stand back i say i want satisfaction of you that is understood marchioness doré i must instantly speak with you this very moment marchioness turns to the right looks at him frightened is it a spectre marquis rises frightened in delirium his voice gradually sinks to agony i know that voice seeing paul i know that face goes towards paul morley morley completely insane repeating the last words of morley your life is in my power sir i but i would have you live that you may pardon me as i forgive you sinks dying in the armchair emmanuel supports him margaret rushes towards her father my father enter la feuille in haste to the left of the marchioness my lady my lady ushered us for the possession on the priest he is dying look here tell him your master stands in need of both end of act three